Let me invite you to turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. I'm going to begin reading at verse 10. Ephesians chapter 4, beginning with verse 10. Uh, as we are, we are coming to the conclusion tonight of our, our study, which we've been using this resource, uh, the Bonsai Theory of Church Growth by Ken, Ken Hemphill, um, as, as kind of a, an outline for our um, study. And I appreciate so much the feedback I've gotten uh, as we've gone through this. And uh, your, you know, your constant encouragement and prayer means so much. Tonight we're going to talk about growing a natural tree. Now we've got our, our little bonsai tree has made it through uh, eight weeks of this study. And, um, but it has taken a lot of effort, a lot of work to get it to remain a bonsai, to keep it small, in other words. And I think, you know, one of the greatest things that we can learn from the bonsai is that it takes a lot more effort to keep this, small, this tree small than it does to let it grow naturally out in, 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 in nature, to let it go to its full size, its full grow to its full potential. So there's certainly a lesson for us in the church there as well. I'm going to look at verses 10 through 13 in chapter 4 of Ephesians. He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. May God add his blessing to this reading of his word. You know, the, the, the natural question for us at this point is, what's next? What do we do now? We, we've studied the scriptures. We have an idea of things that we should avoid if we want to create a bonsai church and remain small and remain uh, below the size of our potential and not grow into what God intends us to be. As cute as the bonsai tree is, it's not natural. Trees were not created to be 10 years old and 6 inches tall. Trees weren't created to be miniature decorations. Likewise, the church was not created to be ornamental. The church was not created to be growth restricted. The very fact that we've been looking at this issue for the past eight weeks or so, is a step in the right direction. It means that we have begun dealing with the confining pot of, of limited vision. Now we have to be willing to communicate our vision and do something, even more importantly. It's not enough to talk about doing something, is it? We have to actually do something and move forward. So understand that we often fear what we don't understand. This is why communication is so important. When God gives us a vision for something that's, that's greater for Him, we need to share that with one another. All we have to do is open our eyes, allow God to, to show us the vision, give us that vision, and then boldly share it in the church, and in faith, allow God to work through us. That's the key. It's not something, whatever vision He gives us, is not something we do in our own strength. It's not something we accomplish by our own might, or our own understanding, our own intelligence. We do it through faith, as God works through us. An acronym that I have often heard for the word faith is this, forsaking all, I trust Him. Forsaking all, I trust Him, faith. I like that acronym. It implies that we're going to do God's will regardless of what others say, regardless of what fears may 
come our way, regardless of any uncertainties that we may have. We're going to obey God and follow through doing what He calls us to do. It means going forward when we don't even know for sure what God has in mind or how He's going to provide for it. So when it comes to sharing our vision for church growth and stepping out on faith to see it become reality, we have to be patient. We have to pray without ceasing. We have to understand that some ideas are going to be met with resistance simply because they're new, they're different. And that's when we have to pray that God will make our hearts and the hearts of others receptive to what He wants to do. That we would see His plan. That we would trust Him in what He wants to do. So to grow a natural tree, and I believe to grow a natural church, we must first of all make a commitment. Make a commitment. If you want to grow a natural tree, you have to commit to do so. It's not enough to talk about growing the tree. You have to follow through. So growing a tree is natural. But that doesn't make, make it easy. It's not easy. It, it will still require work. There must be a commitment on behalf of God's people to allow Jesus to grow the church. We have to remove any restrictive barriers that would hinder growth. We have to allow the Holy Spirit to have His way in the church. Every leader, every member must be committed to biblical growth. And sometimes that means welcoming in people who are new, who are different. People we don't know. See, it's a lifelong process, really, that requires continual planning implementation and hard work but it's worth it it's worth it because church growth enables the church to fulfill the great commission Jesus said go and make disciples well if we're not making disciples we're not going to do any growing so when we when, when the church is growing naturally it's making disciples the great commission mandates that we reach out to those who, are, who don't know Jesus, who are not saved. And this will provide a, a natural, healthy, growing church. It doesn't necessarily mean it's going to explode overnight. What we have to do is be patient and allow the Holy Spirit to do His work and trust Him to grow His church in His time. We do the work of planting. We do the work of watering. But we allow God to provide the harvest in His time. Simply put, what's the best way for Robert L. to experience growth? First of all, I'd tell you that the most natural and permanent church growth comes from small group interaction. Small group interaction. In our church, that would primarily be through the Sunday school. So if you're not a part of Sunday school, you're already missing something very important to church growth. If your Sunday school class is not doing things to reach the lost, then you're contributing to a bonsai church. You're contributing to keeping the church small. Every class should be reaching out to the lost. Every class should be doing all they can to, to bring people in to the fold. We start with those who are already part of our fellowship, but maybe aren't actively involved in Sunday school. And it's, it's obvious, you know, the trend used to be the opposite. 30 years ago, 40 years ago, Sunday school was, a, was far 
better attended than worship. But now if you look, the trend has reversed. Worship services are better attended than Sunday school. And honestly, if anyone were to ask me what, what's the most important thing for me to do, if I only had to choose one hour to come to church every week, if I could only have that one hour, I think Sunday school would be number one. To be a part of a small group. But I think Wednesday night and Sunday night are also vital, as well as our worship time on Sunday morning. But Sunday school has to be a priority. Small groups, we have to be reaching out. We have to find those who are already part of our fellowship but aren't a part of any small group and get them in. And then we have to go beyond the walls. It may mean starting a small group Bible study in your home. It may mean being part of a support group or, or some missions group. If you're not doing that, if you're not a part of one of the missions groups, then you're missing out there. So small groups has to be a priority. But the second thing is that we have to be very serious about prayer. Prayer has to be a priority. And I believe in the power of prayer. I believe it's the prayers of people who, who cared about me, who got me to this point in my life. And I'm counting on prayers to get me going forward, to keep me while I'm going forward. But I know also that this is a praying church. We have people in this church who care and who pray. And, and, and it's, it's a blessing to know that we can call on one another to pray. But not only are we, do we need to pray about those who are hurting, those who are, who are sick, those who are grieving, we need to be praying daily for lost people. Praying daily for those who need the Lord but don't have a relationship with Him. Are you praying daily for lost people? Are you praying daily for our church? Are you praying daily for your pastors and staff? Are you praying daily for our community? For our country? We need to get back to being a people of prayer in every aspect. Not just praying for the sick, praying for uh, the grieving, but praying for the lost. So much so that those people know we're praying for them. That the Holy Spirit will convict them. If we are praying like we ought to be praying, we could be accused of turning the world upside down. Beginning right here in our community. And I'm not just saying that about Robert L. Baptist Church. I'm talking about Christians. If we worried as much about other people's lostness and prayed for them as much as we worry about our rights and our, our, our uh, being respected and, and all these other things that people are so worried about today around our world we would not see empty churches anymore. We wouldn't see churches closing their doors, selling off their property. We'd see churches growing and expanding like they were designed to. Whenever the invitations extended at the close of a worship service, whether you come to the altar or not, I believe every saved person ought to be praying for some lost people especially those who are present in our services at the time. We should be praying for the lost and for the hurting. And I, I do believe that if more Christians made their way to the altar, that it might give some others the courage to step out and walk down the aisle. You know, positive peer pressure is just as powerful as negative peer pressure. Sometimes more so. The courage that a lost person who is sitting behind you or on your aisle may need might just come from seeing you 
come and kneel at the altar. And what's more, when we're praying for lost people right here in our services, I believe the Holy Spirit convicts them all the more. That they really begin to notice. And because they tell you. Once they come to Christ, they will tell you, I knew people were praying for me because I was so miserable. And I knew I had to get something right. I knew I needed Jesus. And that's often my prayer. I pray, Lord, I know that man's lost. And I know he's hurting. And I pray that you'll make him so miserable that he won't leave this place till he gets right with you. And so sometime if you're miserable, maybe somebody's been praying for you to get right with God. Maybe there's something you need to do. There are many things that have helped create a growing church. But I believe these two. Prayer and, and small groups. And, and just the fellowship and growth that comes from being part of Sunday school classes, mission groups, Bible studies. It, it's vital to the growth of the church. We've got to commit to growing the church through the Sunday school. And we need to be constant in prayer. Secondly, we need to nurture the root structure and encourage new growth. If you're growing trees, you don't, then you need to do everything necessary to encourage new growth. To, to be careful you don't damage and destroy the, the root structure. With the bonsai, of course, we pinch off new growth. We don't allow it to continue. It would actually kill the tree because it's confined to this small pot, this small vessel. The roots need to be treated with great care so that they can provide the support that the tree needs. Back a few years ago, as we were living on Roanoke Island, um, there's a beautiful, huge vine of scuppernogs that grows there called the mother vine. And the story is that it was brought over uh, in the 1500s from England was the first scuppernog uh, vine planted in America. I don't know all the details about that, but I know that it's a beautiful, beautiful thing, and the, the, the man actually who has been caring for it for decades just died this past week. But it's, it's a gorgeous, gorgeous thing to see. And the grapes are, are beautiful, and they, they taste good. Um, they sell... Uh, grape juice from this vine as um, medicine to people all over the world. People order, they want that grape juice because it's supposed to be so good for you. Well, a few years ago, the power company up in Virginia, Dominion Power, was, uh, was who we had our power through. They were down there uh, working around the neighborhood where this particular huge vines and they were spraying Roundup and guess what happened some of it got on part of the vines and whether it was actual Roundup but it was something like Roundup and it killed part of the vine well they you know it, it, was, it was terrible they brought scientists in from Virginia Tech and NC State and they studied the vine and and they did all kinds of things to it to, to try to save it from, from, from killing off the entire vine. And they wouldn't allow anyone to eat grapes off of it for, for a whole season. It was, uh, they were deemed unsafe and just went through this big thing. Finally, getting it back into shape. And most of the vine surviving as it had been all because some of the overspray got on to the vine and it worked its way 
into the plant, the root system. You know, we have to be very careful in the church. We have to refuse to prune the root structure of the church. When we discover inactive people who are on our rolls, whether it's in church, in Sunday school, our goal shouldn't be to remove them, but to go get them. And that's what we've tried to do over the last few months as we've worked on our church director. We've tried to contact everyone. And those who said, you know, well, I've moved on. I've, I've, I've moved to another church. You know, you can take me off your roll. We've, we've accommodated that. But then those who said, no, I'm still, you know, I want to stay on the roll. I'm still a part of that church. If they haven't been here, we've invited them. Come back then. We miss you. We want you here. We need to do what we can. Find out what's going on in their lives and do what we can to help them return to church. And what I believe we'll find is that many people who have been chronically inactive may never have accepted Jesus as their Savior. They may never have trusted Christ. And maybe... They joined the church or they joined a Sunday school class without fully understanding the good news of the gospel. And they don't realize what they're missing by not being a part of God's church. We can't lose our opportunity to share the gospel with these people by, by tossing their names in the trash can. Now others may have become inactive out of apathy, or maybe because somebody hurt their feelings. In either case, these people need to be lovingly reached and cared for by their Christian family. Some things that we can do to prevent people from dropping out of church. Well, I'm sure it's not an exhaustive list, but I'll give you some ideas. We should develop programs to encourage new members. There's nothing wrong with Offering a class or a ministry that suits new members, even if it's something we've never done before. Just in the last two days, I, I've had a couple of different people who've asked me, well, you know, why, why don't we have a new members class? Why don't we have a new believers class to help young believers? And you know what? My answer has been, well, that's a good question. Why don't we? There's nothing that says we can't. Maybe that's an area we can pursue to help those who are new in their faith or maybe new to our church to help them be, become more acclimated to who we are as a church, to our denomination, or to the Word and a relationship with Christ. So that's something that I believe we'll be working on soon. Another thing we can do to help keep people from dropping out is to find a place of ministry involvement for new members as quickly as possible. So, somebody joins the church, next month we make them a deacon, right? Wrong. That's not right. When I say ministry involvement, I mean ministry, real ministry. We don't, don't just give them a title, give them a responsibility. Yes, something important. You know, there's not many things more insulting than to give somebody a title with no real job to do. You know, what is it you want me to do? Well, you carry this title, but, you know, it doesn't really mean anything. You know, and if you ever serve on a nominating committee, probably the worst thing you can say to somebody is, you know, we just need to fill this spot. You won't have to do much. First of all, it's a lie, usually, when you tell them they don't have to do much. But it's insulting. You're saying, hey, you're not that important. We want to give you something anyway. We need to be careful about that. I believe that we miss golden opportunities to utilize the spiritual gifts of some of our people. When God sends us people, He doesn't just send us people to be spectators. but to be active, 
to have positions of leadership, to utilize our special gifts that God has given them. Another thing we need to do is ensure that every Sunday school class has regular fellowship events. Preacher, there you go. You're talking about eating again, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah, we do that well. And the church should capitalize on the things they do well, right? We eat well. And it's biblical. I can't help but remind you of that. The, the New Testament church, second chapter of Acts, read it. They ate together every day. They came together and they fellowshiped and they ate. They broke bread. Well, I'm not just talking about eating. But I'm talking about doing things together. I believe every Sunday school class should have a monthly gathering of some sort. At least every other month. But monthly, ideally. Whether it's to just meet at a restaurant after church and, and eat. Or, or on a Friday night to meet at a restaurant. It can be something that simple. Meeting in someone's home for a meal. A time of fellowship. Throw horseshoes. Play board games. It could be something as elaborate as, as a trip somewhere as a class. Maybe to, to see a Christian play or a concert. The main thing is that we include plenty of time for conversation. Time to make sure nobody's excluded. And everybody knows everybody in the class. And these fellowships provide for an informal time of building relationships. Something that we're usually lacking on Sunday morning. Sure, the Sunday school class is the best place to get to know people. But even then, we have a reason for being in Sunday school too. And it's not just to get to know one another. We're learning God's Word. We're being taught the Word. We're sharing and we're, we're helping each other understand the Word. We're growing. So we're, we're hindered by time constraints. But fellowship, as simple as that sounds, is one of the keys to church growth. You know what else? There are people, you and I know, who need to be in church but aren't, who will not come when we invite them here. But if you invite them to your home, or if you invite them to a restaurant, or to the bowling alley, or wherever your Sunday school class decides to have a fellowship, they might come. And then, once they get to know you, and trust you, like you, then they'll come to church. But we have to start somewhere with them. Fellowships are a great time to grow the Sunday school and grow the church naturally. Finally, in order to grow a natural church, we've got to focus on evangelism. Evangelism has to be a priority. Of everything we've talked about these last few weeks, as we've investigated the bonsai theory of church growth, there's one common denominator. It's not new, but it requires our attention. You see, the one thing that every growing church has in common is evangelism. You know, there are a lot of people in Richmond County who will swap churches and this church grow for a while and this church grow for a while and then this one over here and then they come back to this one and, you know, and they go... And that, you know, that, that kind of growth is, is, is going to happen. So there's going to be the give and take there. But true growth that comes from God, that is natural in the church, that we are called 
to help facilitate is evangelistic growth. You know, we don't want to turn anyone away that God leads to our church. We want them here. If God leads them here, we want them here. We welcome them. But there are so many people. There are enough lost people in Richmond County to fill up every church we got in Richmond County without anybody swapping churches. If we just reach out to them, if we just minister to them and share with them the good news of Jesus Christ, every person in here knows somebody right now off the top of your head who needs Jesus, don't you? We all know people who need Jesus. Think about the ones in your life what are you doing to show Jesus to them? And what can we do as a church to show Jesus to them? The Great Commission establishes evangelism as the number one priority of the church. Not to make me feel good, not to make you feel good, but to evangelize. The number one priority of the church. The church that understands its primary mission in terms of the scriptural mandate to evangelize a lost world will be a healthy and growing church. Focusing on evangelism won't compromise the health or the quality of other ministries. It won't water down our fellowship when we bring new people in. On the contrary, our focus on soul winning enhances all our other ministries. Evangelism is the engine that drives biblical church growth. And God's provided all the resources necessary for balanced, biblical, natural church growth. We can be an exciting part of God's plan for world redemption. But we must allow God to remove any restraints that have kept us from growing naturally. I don't know about you, but I'm optimistic about what God has in store for us at Robert Dale. I think he's doing some good things and he's got some great things in store for us. There are going to be people who don't have enough faith to trust God to do what he wants to do. But the field is widened to harvest. God is calling us to do some planting. To do some watering. And to bring in some of the harvest right here in this community. And that's what I want us to do. And I want to ask you to join me in this ministry. Allowing our church to grow naturally. Not to keep it artificially cute and, and small. But to allow it to grow naturally through God's supernatural power. With heads bowed and eyes closed, who do you know that needs Jesus? Because what it all boils down to, most importantly, is whether we're sharing the gospel reaching lost people. What are we doing individually to share the gospel? What are we doing that proves evangelism as a priority to our church? 